Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody this morning. We've got a full schedule today, and we're looking forward to it. We're going to start with Dr. Rob Crossler, who's uh, the chair of MISE, um, Management Information Systems and uh, Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, okay. And so he'll, he'll give an excellent talk. We enjoyed what he did last year. He'll talk about uh, uh, intro to cybersecurity and behavioral threats, and then follow up with assessing risk. Uh, then we'll have a break. And then we'll have cyber overview and opportunities at EFRL, uh, Air Force Research Lab. And so Sonia Glumich is here. Uh, they're in town. They didn't make it. Uh, so they'll be here for that. Um, then this afternoon, we'll be over in the Spark G10. And uh, uh, Montana State people follow WSU when you go to the Spark. You know where it, you know where it is because you were here last year, uh, Andrew. So thanks. And we'll have the poster session and then a break. And then we'll have certificates for those who have gone through the program for one or two years, they'll get a certificate. And then we have the DOD collaboration and John Diaz is here from uh, the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. And they do recruiting. He comes to our campus every fall. And then Aaron Darton, who is the CTO at uh, Naval Undersea Warfare Center goes to Montana State. So you guys that want to make the connections, um, we've got uh, five Montana State people here as well. So uh, with no further ado, I want to present Dr. Rob Crossler, who will talk to us about intro to cybersecurity and behavioral threats. Well, you give people a couple minutes, then I'll probably... Yeah, take a couple minutes. So, so that uh, people who are sent on this interview told the... Uh, so while we give you a minute, just so I know who's in the room, why don't you guys tell me where you're from, kind of what your background is, and we have a pretty diverse um, set of backgrounds. So we'll, we'll start over here and kind of work our way around this way. I'm Andrew Fallon. I'm a PhD student at Montana State and uh, studying what is fun. And distributed energy resource cybersecurity. Cool. Awesome. I'm Tyler Morbeck, uh, also from Montana State University, just graduated with my bachelor's in conservation biology in college. Okay. And how does that fit into the security world? Um, not very much. Okay. Um, really, uh, it applies more to, so I did RGC and just commissioned as a lieutenant. So really that just kind of puts ties that. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. I'm Macy Showalter. I'm also from NSU. I'm working my senior year studying astrobiology. Also in the Army RTC program, I have not commissioned yet. Um, yet, keyword. Yes. <laughs> Contracted, not commissioned. Awesome, good. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm a computer science major here at Pullman. Uh, I'm also in RTC, but here at Pullman. Sorry. The task of 905. I was part of the task of 905 for one year of my life and decided not to pursue the military route. So, um, Paul Rollins. Uh, so if I have information system, it should be finished in the summer. Cool. And you can't sneak through the back without introducing yourself. Oh, I'm Jacob. And you're studying what? Oh, Here at WZ? Yeah. Awesome. Back row. I'm Natalie. Awesome. Computer science and finance. You got the business world going with the, the technical side. Great. Yeah. And I'm Alec, also computer science major. Okay. And you're where at the program? Uh, going to New York. My name is Nikayan, and I'm a chief engineer here, and I'm going to be senior. Awesome. You are a senior, probably, right? Just to finish that junior yeah. year. <laughs> I guess so. Well, welcome. Awesome. Do we have everybody? Are ready to keep oh, wasting time? We have a couple people that are still on their way, but I think it will get started. Awesome. Well, does everyone know who Ossify is? Oh, yeah. They know me. Okay. So I, I'm one of the leads in the cyber program. I'm an associate professor of computer science, and our school is called the Academy of Computer Science. Perfect. And does everyone know Bernie? Yeah. Uh, Bernie Van Weeden, uh, for those of you who I just met, but I've been the lead for the project for the last two years, and that's why I have worked diligently on all things the proposal, my proposal and the project. Uh, Noel Schulz, who's also co PI, and then we have Casper Pine, and Shulman and Shulman. Uh, 
Hello, Sonia. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, have you introduced yourself? Sure. And so, got to see uh, if somebody could get her uh, at the, the, the uh, So, we have enjoyed. Uh, so, Shola is the uh, student evaluator who will be here as well. Uh, he's the associate dean of the site. Uh, Sonia, would you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Sonia will be one of our speakers. So my name is Sonia Blumich. I am a computer scientist at the Air Force Research Laboratory in Rome, uh, New York. And then recently, as of January, I took on the role as the program manager for uh, the Vice Red program. So that means I handle a lot of uh, financial money items in terms of you know, getting the money from OUSD, where the money originates, um, all to the universities eventually as to fund scholarships and, and programs for the students. Thank you for being here. And um, we've got a whole bunch of people walking in the room. We'll have them tell us who they are here in a minute. But the gentleman that's right over here, I don't think everyone here knows who you are. Do you want to real quick? Good morning. I'm John Diaz. I'm branch head at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center. Uh, I'm a research scientist, specifically in the advanced cyber engineering. So uh, great to be here. Okay, thank you. And actually, there's so many people who just showed up. I'm not going to put you on the spot. We'll, we'll get into the material, but uh, maybe a little nervous walking in late. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, so anyways, I'm Rob Crossler. I am the uh, chair of, of MISE here in the College of Business. Um, more interestingly, I am a professor of information systems. I have been doing research in the field of cybersecurity since I started my dissertation at Virginia Tech. Um, started that doctoral program in 2005, really started uh, working in that space at that point in time. Um, I teach the one and only cybersecurity class we teach in the Carson College of Business, MIS 334. Um, which is part of the, the basic certificate that we have. Um, and the focus I'm going to take today is, is really informed by um, the approach I've taken to research, which is trying to understand people and behavior. So uh, I refer to the, this information security research I do as behavioral information security research. So in order to you know, appreciate and understand why do we invest money in great technical solutions, in a lot of ways, we have to understand how that fits into the business world. And a lot of that ties into ensuring that businesses can continue doing what it is that businesses are doing, right? Whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a for-profit, whatever, we have to understand why, why are we going to invest these resources into doing some really, really cool things to protect ourselves. Um, I, I like to tell my students that we don't, we don't necessarily do security just because we can, right? There needs to be a, a return on that investment, if you will, but um, We'll get into that a little bit. So that, that kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're starting and, and what my perspective is um, as we go into uh, this talk. Um, this will be a hands-on sort of class, but not hands-on to where you're going to be programming and that sort of stuff. Um, if you've got a, a piece of paper in front of you, um, we're probably going to use that as you brainstorm ideas and, and do different things. Um, there'll be talking, there'll be collaboration as we really process through um, what it is I want you to think about today. So um, I've broken this up into kind of two blocks. The first hour, we'll be talking about understanding the human and organizational security context, really from the perspective of the Internet of Things. Um, I, I think the Internet of Things is a great place to kind of see how does a new emerging technology cause us issues. Um, I, I think, you know, if I were to, to redesign this, I, I think I could around generative AI. I, I think there's a whole lot of new issues coming out of that, which I think would be fun. Um, I'm not quite ready to, to say that's where I'm moving my, my teaching perspective, but uh, I think I'm going there. Um, this last semester in my class, there were so many current event articles about what this generative AI open up as opportunity, right? Because all these new technologies are great opportunities, but with new opportunities comes new threat vectors that we need to care about and we need to be thinking about. So um, as we talk about things, I want to think about things from the perspective of, of these three terms. So risk. What's the likelihood that something is going to happen that's bad, right? So we've got these assets, we've got these things we care about, and, and we think about risk. What's the likelihood that something's going to happen? And if the risk is very low, we may not really have to invest a whole lot in the protection that asset because, like, you know what? We've got protocols in place that are protecting us. That risk is low. But as the risk is high, we may say, you know what? We need to invest in this as, as a place to do something. We need to find a solution. Um, what are the threats? So, so the risk is caused by a threat, which is that action that somebody could take to do something, right? So um, we have benign or fairly you know, innocent threats. Like I brought my cup of coffee in here this morning. 
I could accidentally spill it and it could land on the computer in here and it could fry it and make it not work, right? We've taken down the availability because of the threat of, of the, the speaker who brought in a cup of coffee, right? But you also have the threats of a, of a nefarious bad actor out there, right? Who says, I'm going to attack this machine and I'm going to install ransomware and make it so you can't. So we have different kinds of threats. Those that are actually um, caused intentionally by, by people that have bad motives and those that are caused accidentally by people. We need to be prepared for looking at both those things. Um, and then the vulnerability, what's the, a weakness that allows that threat to be realized, right? So a weakness um, that lets me bring this cup of coffee in is nobody standing in the door taking my cup of coffee away from me, right? So if I really cared about people not spilling their coffee on the computer, we might actually put some sort of a something into place to prevent that vulnerability. As far as, you know, people getting ransomware on this machine, my guess is there's firewalls and various other things in place that WSU has that prevents people um, from getting inside and getting access. But are there still weaknesses that are out there? Probably, right? Um, could I click on a link on this computer that opens up a pathway because I had permissions as a logon user that, that did something? Um, so what I want um, to talk about, and have you guys help me, the Internet of Things, what is it? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we take things and we connect them to the internet, right? Somebody has a great idea. Wouldn't it be great if I put a camera and connected it to the internet so I could monitor the hallways? Or better yet, put it in my kid's bedroom so I can monitor my sleeping child. Or, oh, wouldn't it be great if I let Amazon come into my house and have a speaker and tell me when my shipments are going to arrive? Um, or my Tesla, I can connect it to the internet. They can download all the updates so I don't have to take it in and have a mechanic do software updates, right? All sorts of, of things, if you will, that we connect to the internet. So what I want you guys to do is to work with um, either it, someone sitting next to you, ideally, but you could do this by yourself if you really wanted to. Um, what I want you to do is take about one or two minutes, identify um, a couple of internet things technologies, and for each of them that you identify, what are the benefits and risks associated with it? And ultimately, who receives the benefit and who is threatened by the risk? So take a couple minutes and brainstorm just a couple of items, benefits and risks of that Internet of Things technology. Technologies that you came up with. I'm gonna start right here and then I'll come down here. 
Yeah. Uh, like a smart home. A smart home. What do you mean by a smart home? Well, some people have like their locks and stuff to make them step on. Okay. And got access to that. They just okay. So, so we're going to say it's the, the, the lock on the front door of my home. Okay. That's, when you say a smart home, you mean that's how I get into my house. Like when I go and stay at an Airbnb and they give me that code and, and then it doesn't have to be like a hidden key somewhere. I can just use my phone. I can remove those privileges and, and so forth. Okay. Who gets the benefit of, of a smart home? User, okay, so if it was at my house, I would get that benefit because I no longer have to carry my house key. As long as I have my phone, I'm good. Okay? Anyone else get benefits from that? The company can sell it. Ah, so Ring or whoever I might buy that from gets the benefit of, of the money. I probably, depending on the, the feature, might pay them a monthly fee, right? So they're getting some financial um, from that. Anyone else benefit from that? So, like Ring, then it's probably going to benefit the police because they're all going to get surveillance access to your. Uh... So, law enforcement might get some benefit as well. It'll help them solve crimes. Um, should there be a burglary in the neighborhood or so forth? Who else benefits from that? Yeah. Other family members. Right. So, my other family members, like I know, like my um, my oldest son just came home from college. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't carry a house key on his key ring anymore, right? So we had to make sure we were home when he got there or he may have been locked out of the house, right? Should we have that technology in place, right, that they benefit from that as well. Um, okay, so maybe a few more. But what are the risks associated with that? Yeah. Um, the house itself doesn't move, so it's kind of hard to find vulnerabilities in that. But that, then that means that you just need to get into the phone, and then from there, you can access them. All right, so if I get access to someone's phone, I might have access to their house, okay? Yeah. Oh, like what? I mean, you have cameras at your front door, and anybody, if somebody gets access to So if someone gets access to that, they might be able to see things that I don't want them to see. Um, it was mentioned up here, the police may actually have access to it for solving crimes. Would they have access to it at other points in time that may be... I wouldn't be able for you. <laughs> Maybe, perhaps. How many of you have ever had your phone die on you? Right? And you don't have a charger available. How do you get into your house at that point in time? Right? Is it, a potential risk that you're straight up locked out of your house until your phone starts working again? Um, does it require internet connectivity? What happens if the internet's down? Right? Is there a risk that you can't actually get into your house if you put these solutions in place? Um, if your phone dies, there's always one way to get into your house, which is to remove the hinges from the door. Right? There, there are creative solutions where we can break windows. There are ways we can get into our house for sure. Um, yeah, but potential risks. Another one, another internet thing. Did you, have, you had one, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was thinking something like Tesla. So they yeah. have um, like the... Uh, AI helper for driving if they have to have internet updates mm -hmm. because AI programs are full of bugs, of course. Um, so the benefit here is that you get to have a continual improvement mm -hmm. uh, in the quality of your software. And the risk is that you would hypothetically have an attacker provide an update for you. So we can get a nefarious uh, install, a bad install on there from a, from a bad person. What, what other, so the Tesla, the car connected to, to the internet. Uh, other benefits besides just, you know, um, the, the driving helpers um, with that. Um, hypothetically, you could have other software installed on it um, that uh, you might be able to download new apps, mm -hmm. for instance. You can download apps. I know a lot of Tesla's recalls I've read about have been handled directly through software updates as opposed to needing to take your car into the mechanic to do a recall effort. Yeah. Um, I mean, how many of you use mapping software? All right. My car, I guess, has one baked in, but I prefer the uh, Apple Maps, so I you know, have a little mount. But that, but that baked into, um, into the Tesla, right? So connecting the car, uh, my guess is your music can probably be played through those internet connections in the car. A lot of those experiences that that make it you know, kind of cool, kind of nice. Um, what are the risks? So bad actors could put other installs in there. What else? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure entirely how this would work, but 
I'm assuming like computers and such, they'll do that thing where it's like you need to update, remind me later, you need to update, and then eventually just like you are updating mm -hmm. and just when does the, the card yeah, well, do that? When's the timing of that update, right? How many of you have gone to work in the morning or started a project and your computer says, no, no, you have to reboot. And 10 minutes later, you're actually finally able to get some work done. You know, could that happen on, on a car? Perhaps, right? Making it not available at that moment that you wanted it available by design, not by someone doing something something bad. I think there's already been reported cases of that happening. Right, I've seen reported cases of, of the brakes being put on of vehicles that are connected to the internet. I think I saw it was a Jeep, not Tesla, but could someone actually take control of the vehicle? Um, how many of you have paid attention to what's going on in the war with Russia and Ukraine? So one of the things I saw related to internet things was not a Tesla, but the tractors are connected to the internet. And I believe it was when Russia came into Ukraine to use the tractors to try to help um, hold the tanks and the tanks were working or whatever, that John Deere actually shut down the ability for the tractors to be able to run um, and, and didn't allow them to be used as part of the war method, right? So if you're a farmer who maybe got behind on your payments and you can no longer use your tractor, it doesn't get repossessed, but it gets shut down so you can't use it. All right, maybe the bank says that's okay, but as the farmer who needs to you know, plow their crops or whatever, it's a different kind of story. Um, right, so especially that. One more, one more internet thing, something that's something that Yeah. Oh, so more on the yeah. cars. Yeah. yeah, I think it was Toyota recently that admitted they had a security vulnerability mm -hmm. that would let an attacker uh, in the real time position of any car. Mm -hmm. So, right, giving your uh, location to the internet. Yeah, and then and then what happens with that? I know you're not home, so I go do something else, or I track you, and when you are in the right place for me to rob you, I can. And all sorts of other things that can come from that. So, yeah, absolutely. Other Internet of Things technologies. Yeah, thermostats. Thermostats. Okay. So uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll call. We'll say the Nest thermostat, right? So getting kind of back to the smart home thinking. So what's the benefit of, of hooking my thermostat up to the internet? Yeah. Um, if you're like on vacation, you can shut everything down. Yeah, we can set it to 80 degrees while I'm on vacation or whatever that magical temperature is where I don't have to pay an enormous bill. And then before I get home, uh, I can set it back to 72, right? So I walk in my house and it's comfortable. So on vacation, what else does the thermostat do for us? My understanding is the Nest thermostat learned your behavior. It knows when I go to work in the morning, right? It knows when I go home and it'll actually start to control the temperature. So I'm not heating or cooling my house at those times when I'm not around, saving me money, right? Being more efficient, better for the climate, right? All, all these things that, that are good. So what, what are the risks of that? Yeah. The electric company can say you just have too much air conditioning. All right, so the electric company can have that information and start to manipulate my behaviors at some level, right? Charge me more, tell me I have to do something differently. Maybe they can take control of it and say, you know what? We're having a surge in usage, so we're gonna only let you set your, you know, cooling to 75 degrees in the summertime because that's plenty cool enough, you're gonna be fine, um, and it's gonna save the power grid, right? It's a risk to me, I don't get to have my house at the temperature I want it because I'm plugged into the network, but a benefit perhaps to, the power company and, and uh, society. What else? What if bad guys got into that? What if they, what if I was hacked into? They could mess with me, right? They could change temperature and I'm all like, what's going on? The other threat that comes as we connect it is someone can actually use that as an entry point into a network to gain access to other things. So we see this as an example a lot of times of things that happen with Internet of, of, of Things devices. One of my favorite stories to talk about in the classroom has to do with a casino in Las Vegas. How many of you have been to Vegas? Right. How many are familiar with the idea that Vegas does things on a very grand scale? Right. Um, you haven't been there in Vegas, they, just, they, they invest on a great experience. And one particular casino had a giant fish tank that they thought it would be great if everybody on the Internet could see what their fish tank is. And so they installed a webcam so the world can look at their fish tank, right? You see this, the zoo, you see this all sorts of places where there's these cool things that we should make it a grander experience than just those people who can come. Guess what? 
That webcam was not properly secured, and it was used as a vector to get into the casino and then to ultimately steal information and ultimately money from the casino because it got into their network. Um, a lot of breaches that happened because someone had this really, really good idea to take a thing and connect it to the internet and without really thinking about how do we prevent those risks from being realized. Um, more with a view of looking at how do I um, get the benefit of, of doing this, this sort of thing. Um, one more quick story about this that I, I thought was really interesting and really opened my eyes to the Internet of Things and connecting things to the Internet. My first faculty job was at uh, the University of Texas Pan American um, in 2009. And I taught a class that was an emerging technologies, kind of, not even emerging technologies, really it was a it was a sophomore level class where we wanted information system students to get a chance to do things with technology, right? So it's a very exploratory sort of see what technologies are, play with them, do something. And there's a final project where they got to pick anything they wanted and you know research it and do a demonstration. And I had one student that was able to come up in front of the class and with about four clicks of his mouse show you how he could take control over any of the webcams in the at the university because they're using the default username and the default password for those particular websites. Because nobody decided to change the default username and password, right? And, and, and you look at that and you say, that is such a simple thing. Why didn't somebody do that? Why? Why did nobody change the username and password on that? Why was that just installed and put in place? Is that a hand? Um, sure, it's a hand. Yeah. Uh, I guess they didn't take that any I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, thought someone would try to do that. That might be part of it. I would say it's probably even more. Um, they might not have uh, necessarily known that, uh, say, the camera would have been accessible for both. Right, so they may not have known it was accessible. They may have been lazy. I, yeah. Sure. Uh, did you ever think that maybe it's not the user's fault? Maybe it's the designer's fault? Maybe they should design the camera in a way that you have. The yeah, so maybe the designer didn't even, you know, basically let a default username and password exist, and that was the same on all the different devices. So we go back further in the chain. I would say the person who set it up maybe didn't realize that they should even change it, right? The, so the person who put that in place may have been a, a manager of some sort who didn't have technical training. So to assume that they were too lazy or to assume all these sorts of things is assuming a lot about that person who decided we should plug this camera in and make it this thing. Right? How many of you had a Wi Fi router like 15 years ago? Did it have a default your same password? Did you have to have, I think it was probably WPA or maybe even WEP at the time, did you have to have it turned on? Did you have to encrypt your Wi Fi router 15 years ago? No, you had to, as a user, no, I need to go turn that on. I need to put a password on there that is not the word password. Um, I need to do some things to, to secure this. What happens when you put a router in place now? You buy one from the store. You, you may have to change the password. The password may actually be on the box, but it's different on every single device. Um, is encryption on or is it off? On by default, right? So the developers change because people, for whatever reasons, don't make security-based decisions, right? They just want to plug in a router and they want it to work, right? What I like to encourage students to think about is if your mom or your dad were to plug in, or maybe even your grandparent, a device, are they going to be thinking about security when they do it? And, and my guess is most of them, unless they have a, a career or a, a track where they were exposed to this, probably don't, right? And so we need to think about those sorts of things. How do we do things in such a way to where my parents, you know, my 70-year-old mother would do something that wouldn't expose everything she does on the internet to different threats. Same thing in the business world, right? We've got a lot of people that aren't security trained making technology decisions. All right, so big takeaway um, I, I like to think about is the user is the weakest link when it comes to security. Things. We can have the greatest security stuff in place, um, but a single bad decision by a user could make that uh, a terrible thing. How many of you know people who write their passwords down? 
Right? Well, almost all of us know somebody who writes their password down. If we have really secure passwords, that's a good thing, right? But if somebody gets their hand on that written down password, that could compromise everything we have in place around that, right? So we're starting to see some things that are addressing that, right? We see multi-factor authentication. Um, we see some of these zero trust sort of approaches to things to where the user making a bad decision doesn't ultimately um, cause the harm. But there then becomes another avenue where the user does something that was not anticipated where they open up this, um, this detector. So what I want you guys to do is um, go ahead and, and we'll do this fairly quick. Just come up with... Um, one um, possible threat caused by an individual. Don't use the one I just told you, right? The whole password book, writing the password set, or not changing the password on the router, right? So come up with something new. A threat caused by an individual. So just take about 30 seconds, talk about it for a second, and we'll come back together. Yeah. Sorry. There's no one like you mentioned with your routers. I've seen photos where they're like, I'm going to put up in the morning. Yeah. Like they might have changed the password, but. They probably did. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's why I would not use a restaurant or at the airport or any place where you don't know how well they secure it. All right, let's bring it back in. All right, some other group that hasn't contributed yet. Yeah, back here. Uh, people use the same password for all of their different accounts. Oh, yeah, use the same password for all the different accounts. Why is that a problem? Because not all things protect you the same level. So, yeah, uh, all things are secure the same. So, partially you use a, the same password that. And that's the problem, right? They crack the one password and they have access to everything else. So if my eBay password is the same as my bank password, which is the same as my work password, when eBay gets hacked, now all of a sudden they can try that same username password combination on every other place that um, they might want to try it. And eventually it will work in another place and we've got a problem. Okay? So what can we do? What, what can be done to mitigate that? So we don't have to come up with a whole new password, but Okay, so I can train. So I'm thinking about the perspective of uh, my my mom, right? I can convince my mom to have different renditions of that same password, so she doesn't have to remember all these different things. Okay, so that's one way, right? What else? You could have randomized passwords with a password manager. Oh, we can use a password manager and let it handle all those sorts of things. Or you right. That's what I was say. Yep. So we go to password managers. Let me tell you this story. How many of you are familiar with the password manager LastPass? How many know what happened with LastPass over the course of the last six months? They got hacked. They got hacked in some incredible ways where one of their senior developers had the entire database of hashed passwords stolen from their computer. Why? Because um, they were allowed to install a video, a movie software, so they could personally watch movies on their work laptop that had all this information on it, right? So some, some horrendously bad decisions. To make it worse, LastPass wasn't completely honest with how things happened and they rolled out what happened over time and I used LastPass. I spent an entire weekend changing 200 passwords because if they had the database and they had all those passwords, it didn't matter if I changed password manager software, right? I do think it's possible to get password managers that aren't stored in the cloud that are stored like on your device. Right, so, so this was the advice back in November, right? So anyway, use a password manager. I don't care which one it is. Last pass, one pass, use one. So that way we don't, you know, we avoid the whole reusing the password situation. And now if someone says, which one should I use? It becomes a more complicated conversation. It's, so this hack has made it harder to give advice to people. Um, you want your passwords so, stored, encrypted, on your own device. <laughs> yes and no, right? The benefit of on my phone, on my computer. I mean, there's, there's interesting challenges. And if you make it too hard for people, they're not going to do it. Right. That's so a password management that is based on your own device is ideal. Yeah. I agree with what uh, I agree with what you're saying. The issue is 
if someone takes your laptop, now they have access to all your passwords that are next to your device. They may be encrypted, but if they have your physical machine, they have all the time in the world. Potentially, right? So you've been getting to see of a user loses their laptop and gets compromised. Was the laptop secured with a proper password? Did they have encryption turned on so that way it protected something, right? There's all sorts of decisions of a user in this situation to where um, things could go very wrong very quickly. Um, so each of these new problems we identify perhaps requires a different technological solution to kind of help us mitigate these threats. One more, one more issue that is caused by a user, and then we'll keep this conversation going. Yeah. Uh, we thought uh, entering sensitive information to like a official business or a unsecured website. All right, so entering, entering information on a non-secured website. So what what's the problem with that? Um, well, typically, like, especially like I've seen things on like, Instagram and social media where these smaller businesses that may not be have like, Secure websites, huh? Um, they're offered some sort of gift. And they obviously require your bank uh, information. Your right, so when you say sensitive information, we're giving away my credit card information, my address on a website that is not using HTTPS, right? So a non secured website. What could go wrong there? Uh, but someone could steal that credit card information, right? So if you're not using a secured website, you are sending that information from yourself to that web server in plain text. And if it's in plain text, anybody who can read those packets in between you and them is going to. And my guess is there are probably bad guys out there who have said, oh, here's some targets that are unsecured collecting this information. So what can we do to mitigate this? How do you prevent people from being stupid? Just don't shop on those websites. Well, but, okay, don't shop on those websites. So how do you tell your mom not to shop on those websites? Uh, actually, you, want to you, you, got, you got thoughts on that? Well, if you tell it, don't shop on the ones that don't have HTTPS. Okay, so how do we know there's HTTPS? Yeah. Uh, some browsers will like stop you and say- Oh, so there might be a browser plug. It might be developed where it says, hey, this isn't secure, don't do it. Actually, um, this used to be needed as a plugin, and now it's actually a standard feature, at least on Firefox. Which okay, I so some web browsers are everywhere, and that will basically uh, force every website to use HTTPS, and if it can't use it, it just blocks the connection. Right, so technology that prevents it. So there's a little lock that you'll see oftentimes in the browser. I think I saw that Google Chrome is actually moving away from that because most people didn't know what that lock meant. Um, and, and so I, I can't remember the statistic, but it was a baffled me how many people didn't know what that was because I live in this space and I'm like, it's so obvious, right? But no, not, not my mom, right? Um, and, and so that lens, I think it's important to take that lens and say, you know what, there may be technological features we need to either make sure in that browser, we have people using those browsers, um, or we help them to get those plugins. So that way they are alerted to the fact that when they come up on one of these web pages, they don't give their information, they don't use it. The Firefox solution is to put up an error page that says, this website is not secure. Mm -hmm. Big letters. Yep. So um, we make it obvious. We hit them over the head with a hammer, right? Make it so obvious that they won't make that bad decision. They won't give that information away. But again, um, comes back to, at some point, I think even in those you know, insecure environment websites, there's buttons you can press and say, I want to give them my information anyways. And one of the big culprits I, I hate is I, I see, I'm going to pick on the government. I, I think, I can't remember the last time I saw it, but it hasn't been that long. Like state of Washington has these websites that are so old and it's like, I have to interact with these people and they haven't updated their infrastructure. Um, and, and then you, you know, like, do I or don't I? And sometimes you have to um, show that information. One of my favorites is when they, they send you your password in a password reset as plain text in your email. That then you know I use Gmail, so Google can see all those things. Like, really, is your system that old that you think this is still a good idea? Um, so sometimes you can't do a whole lot. Um, all right. So when it comes to information security, one of the things that, that we we talked about was a lot of what happens if something gets compromised. And when we're securing things, 
we um, are oftentimes looking at what's called the CIA triad, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. So when we're trying to secure things, we're talking about security, we're trying to deal with one or more of these three things. So what is confidentiality? What does that mean? Things stay secret. Okay, things stay secret? Privacy. Privacy, okay. So only those people who should know what it is yet to know what it is, right? That it's, um, if you're having, if you think about confidentiality, if I have a conversation with my doctor, right? That's between me and my doctor. Um, my boss doesn't need to know about that conversation. But now I take that to the internet, right? So if I'm doing a transaction between myself and eBay, right? That's between me and eBay. Everyone else doesn't need to have access to that information. It should be for confidentiality. Only the need to know that there should have access to it. Integrity. What is integrity? Yeah. So the accuracy and the completeness of the information. So how many of you um, ever pull out your phone to see how much money you have? All right, bring up your bank's app to say, what's the balance? Can I make this purchase? If the bank says you have $1,000, you're like, great, I can buy groceries today. If your bank told you you had $1,000 and you bought, let's say, $100 worth of groceries and the bank really meant that you had $10, what would happen? Yeah. Either get an overdraft or the transaction is denied at the bank, you know, something bad happens. And then who are you mad at? Your bank. Why? Because there is no integrity in that information that they gave you. Um, what if I go to the gas station? And I uh, put thirty dollars worth of gas in my car. I right? buy two gallons of gas or something, right? Um, my, I, and, and the transaction hits my account for three hundred dollars, right? In that transaction, I trust that there is integrity that what it says on the pump that I paid for that uh, that tank of gas is truly the transaction that hits my account, right? So we need to ensure that as information is traveling over the internet, because that's where all of these transactions are, are that information is being sent. That what is truly expected is what is truly there and what is sent, what is received. And then availability. What is availability? Yeah. Ease of access. So ease of access, partially. Yeah. Well, just the trust that it's going to be accessible at any given time. Maybe. Accessible at any given time or at the time when it's needed. And most of the time we think about that as at any given time. Um, if there are some uh, approaches that are saying, you know what, there's no reason why people need to be working outside of the hours of eight to five. Therefore, we're going to take availability away. We're only going to have it available during that window because then we only have to worry about protecting it for a, a subset of the day instead of the entirety of the day. Right? So there are some approaches that say, you know, availability and taking availability off is actually part of our security approach to what it is we're doing as an organization. Um, one of my favorite availability stories uh, has to do with Canvas. Um, people who don't go to WSU, are you familiar with what Canvas is? So Blackboard is a learning management system we use here at WSU. Um, I decided um, to do away with group projects in my class, right? One of the things I heard from students is that um, every class in the college of business beyond the, the you know, 300 and higher does group projects. And when you have four or five of them, four or five group projects, I'll do it at the same time those things. So I said, great, I'm going to do individual projects, right? We can get rid of the freeloaders, everybody kind of has to do their own work. And, but I don't want to listen, or I don't have time to, I didn't really want to, but I didn't have time to have everybody present those projects in front of the class um, when you have like 45 students in class. So load them to Canvas. I will watch all of them. And we'll come to class and I'll share five or six of them. And that'll be our way that we saw some of the really cool things that other people were doing. And we'll use technology to make all this happen. The day of class, that morning, I watched them. By the time I got to class, Canvas went down. So it was AWS had a problem, actually. So Amazon Web Services is where Canvas is hosted. There was some sort of an outage. Canvas went down. I showed up to class and I'm getting that 404 error message here from the Canvas website. Availability was down. I couldn't do my job. So do I cancel class that day? Maybe, right? Yeah, I could. Um, no, no, I got created. Um, and we actually had talked about that semester in a security setting. What happens when your third-party vendor has issues 
And in this case, because of the third party vendor, availability was down. And so we had an entire live case study about the impacts of what happens when a third party vendor lets you down. Right, so that's something else to think about when you're looking at, at how are we doing security things is you contract out to people, right? And sometimes they drop the ball. Who's responsible? If I'm a if I'm a, a company that, that's you know compromised because of a third party vendor, who's responsible for that? I am, but it was the third party vendor's fault. Right, the customer interacts with me. And they trust me to make good decisions on who I outsource things to, who I buy products from. So even though I might actually have some legal recourse against that third-party vendor, um, when it comes to uh, the PR and, and, and so forth of, of who takes the hit, it's the organization. So we want to be careful of even paying attention to um, what security we're being afforded by the services um, that we provide. So as we step into this world of Internet of Things, um, We've got security issues, right? We've touched on a lot of those. There's these security issues posed by connecting things to the internet. I think someone talked about privacy, right? Privacy being an issue as we decide that everything should be connected to the internet. What sort of challenges hit in the state, the, the phase of interoperability? What does that suggest? What does interoperability mean? How many of you have one of these in your pocket? So this is an iPhone. How many of you have something in your pocket that's not an iPhone? All right, I come over to your house and I want to charge my iPhone. Can I? Bring my own charger. If I bring my own charger, but can I use your charger? Well, thanks to Europe, we're eventually getting there because they, they forced the standardization of, of chargers. Chargers, but Apple has always had their own idea that they're better and they're different than everybody else, and therefore, you know, we have to have, have separate chargers. All right, so that's, that's interoperability, right? So your charger on an Android device does not charge my iPhone. What other sorts of interoperability issues come about when we're thinking about Internet of Things besides our phones and chargers? What are the challenges here? Network protocols. Right, so network protocols, we've actually gotten to a big place where network protocols are standardized. It hasn't always been that way, right? Well, here's trying to guess kind of no, uh, we were talking about Europe. Uh -huh. uh, they were also trying to create a law to make it so that like chat applications like uh, Discord, Facebook Messenger, mm -hmm. et cetera, had to be able to interoperate with each other. And that's like, mm -hmm. they don't. They're completely different. There's no way you can make that happen. Why are you trying to pass such a law? Right. So, so this gets into some of the legal and regulatory compliance, um, which I think is going to be a really fascinating thing to look at here in a second. Um, what other interoperability issues are, are we um, potentially running into? Yeah. If you have a smart device, like a smart phone or something that's built by a small company, they might only have the resources to build uh, an app or the Amazon Alexa, but maybe not Google Play. Mm -hmm. So if you buy that product without first checking that the smart phone system that you have is supported, then you might. So decisions might lock us into certain ecosystems that, you know, even if that ecosystem then becomes compromised or no longer even supported by the, the main player, our device becomes unusable, right? So some different potential issues if, if it very much is using one particular company's APIs or various things and doesn't play nicely with the others, we might have some issues. Um, I want to come to the, the legal and regulatory compliance issue. Um, so Europe has, has put some laws in place. How many of you um, saw what Italy did in regards to chat GPT? What happened? For a while, I think it's um, coming back. But why? Well, that's a good question. Anyone know why? That this is the conversation we were having in the U.S., but actually the reason why they were able to, to stop it was something else. Does anyone know why? Oh, I think it was the 
data they're collecting? It violated GDPR, right? So um, in Europe, they have uh, GDPR. I can't remember the acronym stands for. It's the whole reason why we get to say yes to cookies all the time. Um, but it gave consumers right to privacy. Um, it gave rules around how data is collected. And the way that chat GPT was initially deployed was not consistent with GDPR. So chat GPT had to change some things so they could become compliant with the legal and regulatory um, rules that were in place. Um, this is, uh, I watched um, on C-SPAN over the weekend, um, OpenAI's CEO uh, was talking to Congress um, kind of about, you know, what should we do with chat GPT, right? Congress is starting to pay attention to this a little bit. And the, the high level conversation where I think this is interesting is, you know, chat GPT, generative AI, What's the next technology? I don't know, right? We none of us do, right? I think a lot of us were taken by surprise a little bit when ChatGPT hit the world. We're like, holy cow, this is uh, paradigm changing. Well, if you make laws specifically for the technology that you have right now, eventually there's a new thing and it doesn't apply. And so what are the principles around technology and data and stuff that is highlighted by generative AI and how do we put regulations in place that help to make sure those roadblocks, if you will, are in place so it's less likely to be used for evil than for good. Any technology that gets rolled out is going to have bad guys that find opportunities to use it. It's, it's inevitable. But how, how does that work? I, I, I honestly don't know the answer, but it, it's, it's fascinating to look at those conversations. And when I look and, and I heard them talking about a lot of the regulation that applies to generative AI, a lot of it was old, right? It was based on laws and regulations that have been around since um, you know, Section 230 applies, right? If you're not familiar with Section 230, it's what allows uh, Google and YouTube and I guess they're Google um, and Facebook to not be legally responsible for the conversations people are having on their platforms. Does that apply to what's going on with chat GPT? And, and there are the arguments on the, the, the Senate panel about whether chat or Section 230 applied or not, right? That there is this discourse about how do we apply these regulations to these new technologies that are emerging. I remember reading an interesting uh, discussion on the difference between the EU and the US on things. The EU, uh, Regulation then tries to innovate in the US innovation that tries to regulate. Huh. Interesting perspective. Yeah. I'll prefer the latter when it comes to AI. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then what happens when we start pushing all these ideas into e commerce and economic development issues? Um, you know, how does, how does it work when we've pushed everything to Internet of Technologies for these e commerce things and we think about, um, we think about like uh, if you live in the city and you have access to high speed internet versus um, you live in rural America where high speed internet isn't as accessible. We ran into this during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? When it came to education, the whole economic development around education. And we've said to all the students, you go home for a year and through Zoom, we will deliver higher education to you, right? That works for a lot of people. But there were some people who had to drive and sit in a parking lot at a Starbucks in order to have their internet connected because they couldn't get the speed internet connected to their home. What are the implications of that from a societal perspective where there's the haves and the have-nots when it comes to um, these sorts of connections? We need to be thinking about those things um, and not just say, just because we can, we should do this for everything. How do we keep things accessible? Um, so when it comes to dealing with people, there's um, a lot of different ways we can um, address these issues. And we've seen um, these come up with conversations. So we can limit access to people, right? Um, if we think about the, the, the education system, we can all log in and see our own grades, right? Each and every one of you at the end of the semester logs in and says, what grade did I get? But you can't see access to someone else's grades. You can't change your grades, right? I could do that as a professor, right? I can log in and then set those and change those. But we limit people's access of what they can do. Um, we can separate duties, right? The person who's writing the checks is not necessarily the person who is authorizing that those checks can be written. Um, we wrote, we have people rotate jobs um, and take mandatory vacations. Those, those are related. 
What that does is it forces somebody else to do that same work. So if I found a way to be fraudulent towards my organization, and someone else then steps in and does my job for a while, or I go on vacation for a week, somebody else can see, oh, <laughs> there's some funny business going on here. We need to look into that a little bit closer because I'm not there to protect other people from seeing um, what it is that I'm doing. Um, training and awareness. Uh, a lot of you have probably been through these sorts of campaigns or were you expected to go through training to learn how to do something uh, more secure? This is a pet peeve of mine a little bit. How many of you have gone through security training? Was it informative, educational, and great? No, okay, so you can head no, why not? I don't know. It's usually, it's usually very, it's not very specific, I'd say. It's rather boring. It's not very engaging, it's rather boring, yeah? Yeah, that's kind of what he said. It, it kind of applies to the lowest common denominator. If you know anything about security, it's pretty boring. If you know anything, it's pretty boring, and it's usually the same thing year after year. You just have to refresh yourself. It's usually like developed by the security pros, if that makes sense. and. Honestly, they might not be experienced in the whole communicating it in a clear way. But they're not terribly creative in putting together those programs. Uh, how many of you have been through a security training that was like what we've done in the last hour in this class? Paul? Yeah. You were here last year, right? Yeah. We played this game last year. But most of the time, they're videos on your computer, right? And you click through them. If you're like me, you're watching something else while you're looking through your training videos just so you can satisfy your employer that you completed the training. Or if it's in person, it's what I like to call death by PowerPoint, right? Where I'm just going to click through the slides because I have to, and you're going to sit here and you're going to the text. Um, very rarely do these sorts of things become engaging in a way to where because they were engaging, you remember it a little bit more because you did something. Um, and then social engineering is another big one. Social engineering, the whole idea of phishing attacks. Um, if you remember nothing else today, let me share this with you. Um, if you're not from WSU, I apologize. But the email address is abuse at wsu.edu. If you're not familiar with that, remember that. If you get something that you think is a phishing attack or some sort of social engineering, forward that email to that email address. And they will take steps to A, make it to where that, that page won't resolve in the future, right? They've got some steps they can reach out and shut those down. But they also, it's oftentimes when I get them, it came from a WSU email address. So someone was compromised, their email address was used to send these things and get around the full, it's an external email sort of filters. And they can reset that person's password and then take care of those things. So abuse at wsu.edu. Know that email address. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're very good. So, um, and I'm, I, I, I would be surprised if other institutions um, associated with um, with this program don't have something similar. But social engineering takes more forms than just uh, spam and phishing emails. It's, it's probably the worst. Um, this is an area where I think is worth paying attention to as, as we enter into this world of generative AI as well, um, because through generative AI, you can create some very, very real material. Um, and, and you can do it, you know, one, one of the tricks to recognizing social engineering has always been look for that grammar problem, right? There, there's a typo in there or something. Well, now we don't have to worry about typos, right? We have a uh, chat GPT to do it for us. So. Here's a, a potential application, right? You take a tool like auto GPT, what happens when you take chat GPT? and you give it the ability to perform like analysis and planning, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you say, what I want you to do is I want you to look onto this guy's social media pages and this link, this link, this link, uh, analyze it and formulate a spear phishing email in order to personalize um, a, a way to get to password. Yep. Then I want you to create a website that would look like he would uh, click it, post it uh, at this particular server. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to automate this and I want you to do it for every single person in this organization. Yeah, no, it, it's very true. The, the technology of, of that's coming up with generative AI is going to make social engineering so much easier. I actually think this is going to be a huge, huge issue um, that we need to. Um, at some levels, change our thinking around how we prevent. And, and I honestly don't know what that is, but um, the, the tools we have right now, I think um, 
were built for the prior generation. So um, anyways, that completes the first block of this.